So if you are active on GitHub towards the start of the year, you might notice that on your profile, you now have this thing called the Arctic Code Vault Contributor Badge. And when I first saw this, I had literally no idea what this was for. I didn't think I'd contributed to anything called the Arctic Code Vault. I didn't know why this was here. Maybe it was a bug. But then I decided to go and actually explore what it was because I did know one thing about this, and that is that it sounded pretty cool. So... I've got these two articles right here, and we're going to briefly have a look at the first one and then mainly go over the second one. So, what actually happened is in Svalbard Archipelago in Norway, now follow along with me, this is going to get really weird, GitHub is using a decommissioned coal mine, which is maintained by the Arctic World Archive, and deep underground in the permafrost layer, which is basically ground that has been frozen for two or more years, last year in 2019, Around the same time, what GitHub actually did was they took thousands of the most critical repos, so things that are the most important software to open source software, so things like Bitcoin, Linux, Rust, Python, Ruby, Rails, all of these things where if you have any interest in programming whatsoever, you have probably heard of things that are absolutely critical to the way that the world functions with open source software. And what they did is basically took all of these repos and stored them on something called silver halide film. Now, the reason why they use silver halide film is because this is supposed to last a thousand years. So what this is, is an archive of all of the world's most popular open source software stored on a storage medium that is supposed to last a thousand years from now. And you might be wondering, well, I haven't contributed to any of these big repos, so why am I actually on this? And that brings us to now. And that is because the vault is being expanded. So on February 2nd, 2020, what GitHub did was they took a snapshot of every single public repository on GitHub so that they could archive them in the vault. So over the last several months, with one of their partners, PyQL, they wrote 21 terabytes of repository data to 186 reels of this film. And basically what they did is they flew this out to Svalbard Archipelago in Norway and are just putting it in the vault. So every single public repository on GitHub as of February 2nd, 2020, is now being archived in this vault. But the GitHub Archive program isn't just this vault. There's actually a couple of other stages to it as well. So let's actually go have a look at those. Now, in this archival program, there's what's being described as eight pace layers. Now, a pace layer is basically a layer that gets updated at a certain pace. And the reason why you want to have multiple of them is so you can have some of them updating quicker than others. So, for example, the first one is the GitHub layer. So every single time that you push something to GitHub, you create a new issue, you create a new pull request, Basically, this data is going to be distributed across a multiple of the GitHub data centers. And the reason why you'd want to do this is in case, say, one of the data centers has a fire or one of the servers breaks down, one of the hard drives breaks, or even multiple of them break at the same time. In case this was to happen, basically having it across multiple places is going to make sure that you won't actually lose that data. And, and this is pretty standard fare for any of these big web applications. So Amazon does the same thing with its shopping data. Netflix does the same thing with its video data. And basically any service that cares about its data is going to be doing this. And this layer is basically being updated as soon as any changes are being made. And also because it's being updated so quickly, it's still going to be really quick to access. Now moving down to the next layer, we have the GH torrent layer. So GH obviously stands for GitHub. Now it was called GH torrent because it was initially using BitTorrent, but now it's only distributing data through HTTP. So the torrent in this case basically means like a torrent of data. So a lot of data being sent through. Basically, this is just an externally controlled GitHub mirror. And what this is going to do is maintain snapshots of all of the public repositories on GitHub by the hour, day, and month. And this is queryable through BigQuery. And moving down to the next layer, we have the GH archive layer, which is very similar to the GH torrent layer, but is going to be updated at a slower rate. And then we can move on to the internet archives. So the internet archives you've probably already heard of before for things like the Wayback Machine. So what they're doing is they're using the Wayback Machine to basically crawl across all of the public repositories on GitHub and then just making copies of the repos, issues, pull requests, wikis, so on and so forth, and then storing this data on hard drives in places like San Francisco and also other places as well. 
So as with the thing I said about the GitHub data centers, this data is also being stored in multiple data centers as well. And you can actually go and access this data in the same way you would clone something from GitHub itself. So you can go and access it through the Git protocol or also through HTTPS. So moving down to the Software Heritage Foundation, basically this is just gonna be another archive of the public repos on GitHub. And as we're going further and further down the list, the rate that these are being updated also slows down. So next we have the Bodleian Library. I didn't actually check the pronunciation of that, so I don't know if that's correct, which is basically Oxford University's library. And what they're gonna be doing is basically maintaining a quicker updating redundancy of the Arctic vaults. So they're not going to be storing all of the data. They're only going to be storing the 10,000 most starred repos, but it is still some redundancy in the case that anything actually happens to the Arctic Vault. And like with the Arctic Vault, this data is also being stored on this silver halide film. And then we get to the Arctic Vault itself, which is being maintained by the Arctic World Archive. Now, there's one thing I didn't mention about this vault earlier, and that is that it's not like all of this film is just gonna be sitting out in the open in this decommissioned coal mine. No, what's actually gonna happen is all of these reels of film are going to be stored in a steel walled vault, which honestly just sounds really cool. And then we have the slowest updating stage, and this is Project Silica from Microsoft Research. Now basically, what they wanna have is not just a thousand year storage, they want to have 10,000 year storage of every single public repository available on GitHub. And the way they're gonna do this is by storing it on something called quartz glass platters. I have no idea what quartz glass platters are supposed to be. They sound really cool though, so if anyone actually knows what that is, then feel free to explain it down below because that's definitely not something I've ever looked into before. And it's not entirely clear by the colors that are happening here, but I'm assuming that Project Silica is supposed to be updated every five plus years. So obviously GitHub is being updated in near real time. And then as you go down the list, it gets slower and slower how much these are being updated, but they're also supposed to last longer and longer amounts of time. Now you might be wondering, well, why do you need to store on so many different things? Well, this is just a pretty basic concept about storing data. If you want your data to be extra safe, you don't just wanna have multiple backups in the same location. You wanna have multiple backups in multiple different locations. And if the data is really, really important, you want some of that data to be on some longer forms of storage. So things like tape drives, which is supposed to last around 30 years, assuming you have a properly climate controlled environment. So if your data is super, super important, you're going to have multiple storages in multiple locations on multiple sorts of storage mediums. Now, another thing is what exactly is the point? Why would you even wanna go and archive all of this code anyway? What, what benefit is that gonna to have to us in the future? Well, one thing is that future historians can go and look at this code and learn a bit more about how we actually manage open source projects in the current year. Maybe in the future, assuming that civilization doesn't collapse, the way that programming projects are being maintained in a completely different way. And let's say with an example of say Roman concrete, they're being maintained in a way worse way than they actually are. So if you don't know about Roman concrete, basically this concrete has basically lasted 1800 years, which isn't even feasible with the concrete technology we have today. So maybe in the future, it's gonna be the same way with our code. Maybe there's something about what we're doing today that gets lost in the future that could really improve the way that projects are actually being maintained then. And there are even modern examples of this. So take all of the companies which are running some closed source software that they've been running for the past 30 or 40 years. No one has any ability to maintain it because the original source code was lost. All they have left is the binary and they know that it works on the hardware they have it on and they can't really do anything about that. But let's say instead that code was actually archived in a program like this. Well, what can actually happen is you can go and look at the vault and say, okay, well, Here's this code that can bring this system back to life. Maybe we can actually move on to something else rather than trying to guess what this system is doing and even trying to reverse engineer it in some cases. If you can actually get access to that source code, it's going to make maintaining that system so much easier and in some cases make it so it's even possible. And that brings us all the way back to our starting point. So why do we actually have this badge? Well, basically what this badge is, is an acknowledgement that millions of developers around the world on GitHub have all got their code archived in this vault. So anyone who had any projects that end up getting archived now has this badge. So if we go look over here, 
things like my D menu FM fork, my dot files, my scripts, and I'm going to assume most of my other repos ended up going into this vault. So if you're confused about this badge, hopefully this goes and actually clears that up. Now, if you didn't get the badge, I actually made a slight mistake earlier. It's not every single repository, it's every single active repository. So if you go and say, make an empty repository, that won't be included in the Arctic Vault. But most things will be included. So if the repository has a single commit between November 13th and why are they using two different date formats here? So November 13th and the 2nd of February 2020. So anything in that three month window, if you have made a single commit to that repository, it will be included. And everything outside of that window, so every repository with at least one star and any commits from the year before, and also anything older than that with at least 250 stars. So anything older than that will be all of the repositories that were really popular in the past, but no one is actually maintaining them anymore. So I did make that slight mistake and I did want to correct that just in case someone actually tries to correct me in the comment section. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about today. But before I go, I wanted to thank my patrons. So a special thank you to Joachim Craig, Nathan, Andrew Montezar, Peter D. Rowe, Tony, Chris, Donald, and Zilver. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to that down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gear I use in this channel, or anything else you want, and I'll have a small kickback for it. Also, remember to go check out my podcast, that is Tech of a Tea, available on Library and YouTube, and the audio version available wherever you listen to audio podcasts. Also, remember to go check out this channel, available on Library, BitTube, and BitChute, and remember to smash the like button and leave me a comment down below, and remember to subscribe and ding the little bell down below as well. So I think that's everything for me, and I'm out.